Thank you, JB, and thank you so much for being here. Um, before, so this is a new talk that I um, made at the airport yesterday, but I've been thinking about for a while, and actually I want to shout out Ariel Rokem, who gave me the idea to do this talk a year ago when I was complaining about people not building open and inclusive communities online. And he was like, you should just go ahead and tell them how to do that. Um, so I did. It's a ridiculously intense and sort of super fast talk. So I'm going to go a little bit slow right at the very beginning. And then I'm just going to like roller coaster through my 100 slides, which is outrageous. Um, and then I am here for the rest of today and tomorrow. And I would love to talk more about, more about the things that I'm sort of uh, bringing up with you at any point. Um, and the main thing that I want to start off with saying is thank you so much for being here, because if you care about building open communities, literally by being in this room, I really, really appreciate all of the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. Um, I have a, a talk that I've given multiple times. And if you've heard me speak, you've seen this slide before. It usually says reproducible research on there. But there's loads and loads of incentive barriers about why we don't have reproducible research. So we've talked a little bit about them in terms of FAIR this morning. Um, there's a massive publication bias towards novel findings. People don't want to have to show evidence for the fact that they may have made a mistake along the way. Um, it's not currently considered for promotion or getting grants. It requires extra skills. All of these incentive challenges I am not going to talk about today. So they are there, they are in the backdrop. I have this slide in here because um, the reason that I joined this strike in the uh, UK last year in, in uh, February 2018 was because on the very first day of the strike, I was giving a talk to master's students about reproducible research and open science. And I realized that my deep, deep belief that we will together build something that is stronger and better than any individual corporation or organization or group or academic could build by themselves meant that I really had to go out and stand on the picket line with my union. Um, I also have a talk, I gave a talk at OHBM this year that the slides are available online and um, my friend Ross did a like superhuman tweet thread of all four talks in the Open Science Symposium. And again, I'm not going to talk about this, but I do think it's really important to recognize that these like structural challenges are there, they're always there. So when I think about open leadership, I think about it from uh, Mozilla's framework because that's how I was trained. And what that to me, they, they break it down into three areas, that all of the work should be understandable, that it should be very, very easy to share and reuse, and there should be co-design and co-production from the beginning, so you have a participatory governance. And uh, at the airport yesterday, I sort of went a little bit wild and I entertained myself coming up with this using um, CC by icons from the Noun project. I have a slide at the end that acknowledges all of the artists. And these are the 10 rules that I'm going to take you through. But first, because I'm hyper confident that I'm going to run out of time and be chased off stage, for each of these 10 uh, rules, I've used an example project from uh, 10 different open source projects that I'm a member of, and I want to put my acknowledgements right at the beginning here. So um, last summer, INCF funded through Google Summer of Code um, the Bid Starter Kit, Patrick Park, to work with Dora and me on the Bid Starter Kit. Um, I work very closely with Tim and Chris, but there's a huge and amazing binder community that are part of Project Jupiter. Um, and this is funded by the Turing um, AI for Science and Government funding. Uh, I've a, had a student this summer called Ruslan Yemakov, who's been working on SCONA, which is a structural covariance network analysis package and visualization tool. And I want to thank uh, the funders for that. Tadana is going to appear. This is for Echo Time TE dependent analysis. It's a project that's um, led by Elizabeth Dupree. But uh, Monica has been working as a Google Summer of Code student, and Taylor and Josh have been co-supervising uh, her with me. And Dan Handwerker at the NIH is putting on a sprint um, coming up in the next couple of months. 
The Carpentries, I think, are a wildly inspirational organization. I think they're doing absolutely incredible work um, in collaboration with Ottertech Consulting for Codes of Conduct. I have a project that I'm leading with uh, my postdoc, Georgia, um, James and Bastian from Autistica and Open Humans. Um, is, uh, respectively, I think that is a really cool project and I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. The Turing Way is my like hyper -tweet <laughs> tweeted about project and I had a massive, massive team of people working on that last year. Uh, Becky, Louise, Sarah, Patricia, James, Rosie, Anna, Alex, Martin, Malvika, and it's funded by the Turing AI for Science and Government as well. Uh, it could not be a talk at um, INCF if, it wasn't did, if I didn't mention the brain imaging data structure. So shout out to Chris, Franklin, Stefan, Russ, and INCF in general for supporting the project. Um, this is my favorite icon. I'll explain it obviously when I get to it, that um, I've learned an awful lot around kind of thinking about the whole life cycle of a project from Dirk, Sarah, and Danielle. Um, and then every single one of these rules is inspired by my relationship with the Mozilla Open Leadership Mentorship Scheme. Um, so a huge shout out to Abby, Chad, Aurelia, and obviously the funding from Mozilla for them. So these are our 10 rules. We're going to enjoy them. Let's go. So the first one is to lay out your welcome mat. And that, if you're working on GitHub or on an online forum, will probably be your readme file. And a readme is a special file on GitHub. You probably already know this, but you might not have thought about it. If you call a markdown or an RST file readme, it will automatically be rendered underneath your list of files when you go on, um, on GitHub. And that is the first thing that anyone will see when they come along to your repository. So that is telling everyone why they should care about being there. In this one that Patrick made, we have a table of contents. We have some information about the motivation, the project summary, some information on how to find out more information, a little bit about the philosophy, some of the benefits for um, public good and for yourself of being involved. There's a couple of nice icons and we um, tell people how they can get in touch to contribute more and we acknowledge our sponsors and also we tell people how they can acknowledge the academic publications that have supported it. So that is the first thing that anyone is going to see and it's really important that it has some really engaging content about why people should stay in. The number of readme files that are still just the template from the default that's added when you open a GitHub repository is kind of sad. I would like to be taken extremely literally here. I want silence during all coffee breaks and lunch lunches. No, nope, I'm joking. Um, what I mean by don't have conversations in the kitchen is that you build up um, cliques that are completely unintentional, but are very, very exclusive. And it happens to be the case that a lot of times these are not for easy tasks. You often go and have conversations in the kitchen when you need to think through something really difficult. And what that means is that the people who have the deepest knowledge about a project um, do not share that information online and in an accessible way that allows people to be able to come and join the project in a meaningful way later on. So I want to shout out Binder um, because I think they're doing a really, really fantastic job here. This is their readme file and they have three different badges here that you can go and uh, find out more information about the the project management and what they're thinking about at the moment. So they have some issues on GitHub and you can scroll down and see those. Some of them have uh, nice accessible badges that would help you go through and decide um, which ones you might be able to help with. There's also a Gitter channel, which is kind of like an openly available Slack. So you don't have to download anything. You don't have to be uh, invited. You're able to just kind of come along and chat in there. And that's a really nice way of sort of that water cooler kind of having fun and thinking through things and chatting to each other. Um, and because Gitter scrolls very, very quickly and you lose information very quickly as, you, um, as lots of people chat, they've recently moved to a platform called Discourse. Discourse is the same platform that Neurostars is based on, so it's all exactly the same functionality if you've used Neurostars. There's a few different categories here. And you can see, for example, stuff about community chat, governance, special topics, a meta one. Um, if you go to Binder, you can see the particular discussion points that they're having there. I've just pulled out this specific example just so that you can see it, that 
Um, Tim is thinking about different user interface tweaks on my binder, and he's got a, a GIF in there that tell, tell, sort of demonstrates what he's thinking about, and there's a back and forth conversation thinking about how you can make that page less scary, more accessible, and more understandable. So you can have conversations when you go to the kitchen around the water cooler, when you're chatting with your friends and coming up with ideas, but if you can put some effort into capturing the essence of those ideas in a way that people will be able to see how that conversation progressed, you make the project a much, much more accessible space to join. Uh, once people are motivated to join, so that's the readme file, they've got excited about it, they can see what sorts of things you're thinking about, then you need to give people guidelines on how they can actually contribute, and those are your contribution guidelines. So this is uh, the SCONA project, and if we go to our contributing guidelines here, it talks through, it says a little bit at the beginning that says thank you so much for contributing. We've got um, sections on share your thoughts, we want to hear from you. Uh, we've got a little bit of information on um, the, the labels under the issues, so we're explaining what the issues are and how we use them and what you might be able to learn from those. So we have ones on uh, questions and we have a couple of examples of how you can join in, you can positively join in with those conversations. We have ones that are for no code, so if you don't feel confident writing code but you want to come along and help us run the project, then those are really great issues to get started with. We have good first bugs or good first issues. Uh, for folks, and we highlight in bold that there are no stupid questions. We have ones that are marked with help wanted, bugs, or requests. So if people want to ask for something, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have to do it. And then in the next section, we talk about how you make a change on GitHub. So one of the things that I personally think is an extremely high barrier to people contributing to open source is how difficult doing a pull request is if you've never done one before. There's a huge amount of jargon. There's a very sort of different framework for collaborating. And if you're not used to it, it's really hard. And so our guidelines have an explanation of create an issue, tell people what you're going to do, make sure that you're not reinventing or redoing work that's already happened elsewhere. Fork the uh, repository, make the changes. And uh, we actually have a separate file, because it got really long, of a development guide. And that development guide, so I'm just pulling up a screen grab here that's another um, file, has information on installing an editable mode. That's a different way of installing the project versus if you just wanted to run the code. Uh, linting, writing doc strings, building the Sphinx document the documentation web pages, uh, tutorials, and testing on random seeds, and on. and then we have a worked example. So we have a little bit of information about what we expect the contributions to the project to conform to, and then Isla built up this really fantastic example that takes us through um, doc strings and the linting that's expected for those, a little bit of adding a test if you're going to add some new code, um, and we finish all of these by just saying thank you so, so much for going through all of this work, because as you can see from all of my screenshots, there's a lot that goes into contributing to an open source project, particularly the first few times. So you've done that, you've gone through here, you can submit a pull request, and then we also have a way of recognizing contribu contributors. I now use the emoji code, but the um, SCONA project is a little bit older, and so we use the Let's All Build a Hat Rack project. It's a blog post that I like extremely strongly uh, recommend from Leslie Hawthorne, the links are in there. And uh, it's a live web page that tells you who has contributed, including the folks who have just the clapping hands signal. They have not uh, made a commit to the GitHub repository, but they've participated in either reviewing code, contributing to issues, and adding to the discussion. So it's a really nice way of um, acknowledging those, that breadth of types of contributions that we can welcome. Um, and we let people know how they can ask us questions, and we say thank you. That's going to come up, and it, that's going to come up a lot. So the fourth rule is to set explicit expectations for the project content. And um, what I mean by that is that this is your roadmap. This is where you set a vision for the project. And this is where you say what is in scope and what is not in scope for the project. Because although an open source project is really great, and if people know how to do a pull request, they could come along and do an awful lot. You still have to put a lot of effort into making sure that you are taking that project 
in a direction that is uh, useful for you, useful for the community that you're looking to serve, and sustainable. So you can't do everything immediately by tomorrow. You have to prioritize what you want to talk about. And one of the ways in which you can communicate, communicate that to your community is through your project roadmap. So with uh, Tadana, and I just wanted to pull up our Read the Docs page because it's got our fantastic logo that uh, Dan created. We have, a, um, we have a bunch of different documentation on that page, but one of those is the roadmap. And we've got um, a project vision there, and we've got six different milestones, which are our metrics of success. Um, we want to include, sorry, we want to include uh, documentation is really important to the project. The fact that we, want, we can support transparent and reproducible uh, processing. We want to make sure that we have a lot of tests in our project. Um, and these, all of these have, hang on a sec. Oh, yeah, I know. I know what was going on here. Sorry. <laughs> um, all of these have associated milestones. That's why that, that was supposed to be my cue. And so this is a vision in the documentation, but the milestones themselves are collections of issues. And so you can see that we have these various different milestones. The issues can be collected into those, and then you'll be able to see a little bit of that vision and how we're doing on those particular um, issues that we want to move towards being able to achieve that goal. So another one, uh, another of our milestones is workflow integration with AFNI. Another is a workflow integration with BIDS. One is on having a method extension and improvement. So one of the things that we want is to have people add to the project to make it even better, not from being inside of the core team. And a final, our sixth is that we want to have a healthy community. So this is the sort of work that often the leaders of the project, the, you know, the two, three or four founders and a couple of the people that they work with will have these conversations about thinking about what they want to do. It's actually something that's kind of useful if you're going to write a grant, for example, and ask for money, you'll probably have to say what your objectives are, what your deliverables are. But there's an awful lot of open source projects that are run in people's spare time and they often don't put that effort in. And the point that I want to try and make is that it's, there are selfish reasons to be super, super clear about what you're doing. The most obvious is if people want to take the project in a direction that you don't want to take it. You have a place now where you can say, do you know what, that doesn't fit in with our roadmap. We are interested in hitting these particular goals, but hey, it's open source. You fork it, take it, do what you want. We're super excited for, for you to be successful. Um, or if someone comes along and says, I want to help, this is a great place to help people get uh, sort of aligned with your vision. <laughs> the fifth is um, around your code of conduct. So it's really important to set expectations for your community interactions. And this is where I want to bring in the Carpentries. They did a huge, huge amount of work earlier this year to think about how to build a really safe space. Um, that GitHub repository renders to a, a website and the code of conduct is front and center in the um, Carpentries handbook. There is a summary view that says that we're dedicated to providing a welcoming and supportive environment for all people, regardless of background or identity. Um, there are sort of a few bullet points and links to the guidelines. There's also a much more detailed view that talks you through why it's important to have a code of conduct and more details about the specific code of conduct. It's got a section on expected behavior and it's got a section on unacceptable behavior. So instead of just saying, hey, people, be nice and don't touch people, uh, there are actually very explicit examples of what being nice looks like and what harassment looks like. And they also um, link out to the consequences of unacceptable behavior. And they keep this updated as people um, develop it going forwards. Associated with this already quite long code of conduct, there are very, very detailed incident response guidelines. So if you are an instructor, if you're running an event, or if you, like me, are using this code of conduct for your own community, you have a lot of guidelines on how you can make an immediate response to ongoing incidents. Uh, you have checklists for responding to a report and responding to an incident for an immediate response, an in-person event, or online and communica communication channel reportings. 
Um, there's another file, there's a lot of documentation here on uh, the incident response procedure and the enforcement guidelines. It's got a little bit of information about what will happen and what the terminology that comes down even further down is. Um, it talks through the whole procedure, acknowledging the report, um, making a first assessment of the incident, following up with the reportee, and then it's got some suggested resolutions. And one of the sentences that I'm sure you can't read in there is saying there are many possible uh, resolutions and we're not locked into any of these specifically, but there are lots and lots of possible um, actions. So one of the sort of big misconceptions about codes of conduct is that it's all or nothing, that you either pass or fail the discussion and you're either in or out of the community. There's actually lots and lots of ways in which you can stimulate a really positive response um, going forward. There's an appeal process and there's some information about accountability for the organization um, and also on conflicts of interest. I, I give longer talks about this and I like this slide up there. Um, I put the word on phallic sepsis up there to remind me what it is. It means navel gazing. And my advice to you if you're looking to run an open and inclusive community is that while you can take the, co the Carpentries Code of Conduct and all of those materials, they're all open source, you can reuse them under a CC BY license. You have to do the work of really thinking about what you want to, ha to reward within your community. So it is not possible to just put up a code of conduct and say everything is fine. You can say it, but things won't actually be fine. You have to do the work about thinking about what you want to um, encourage. I've got four more minutes according to my timer. I think it's really important to send regular updates about what's going on. For anyone who follows GitHub repositories, when there's lots and lots of conversation, which is what you would hope from a healthy community, there will be loads and loads of notifications and it gets really overwhelming. So one of the things that you can do is send summary, for example, monthly updates. This um, citizen science project that I'm running with in collaboration with Autistica, one of our goals is to um, co-design it and co-produce it with uh, members of the autistic community. And an aspect of autism, which is not the case for everybody, but is um, a sort of prevalent challenge that some people have, is that big blocks of text and lots and lots of possible options is very confusing and very off-putting. And so one of our collaborators has um, left this, this long comment talking through how ridiculously difficult it was for her to try and actually contribute to this project because there were so many possible ways that it was actually really confusing and all of these links on this website that she didn't know how to use and couldn't install on her iPhone, et cetera, et cetera, was really difficult. And so what I've done is I've responded to that. I've added in some suggestions of things that we can do. And what I, what I was really reflecting on is that I think it's going to be really important when we send out our second newsletter, we just sent out the first in August, when we send out our second newsletter, which we use through Tiny Letter, which is now owned by MailChimp, um, instead of giving lots and lots of information, we're going to focus each month on one specific ask, which is much clearer and re reduces the amount of information that people are having to process through in order to come and help you for free for your project. I think it's super important, even though I say that you shouldn't talk in the kitchen, um, it is important to make time for face-to-face -face interactions. And so I'm just shouting out the Turing way. In uh, May this year, we ran a book dash event. A book sprint is usually three to five, day, five days where you get together and write a book. And a book dash is just a one-day event. Um, these are the wonderful folks who came along to the Manchester one. These are the wonderful folks who came along to the London event. Um, one of the things that we did the night before is we went out for a nice dinner, we chatted to each other, we sort of, I tried to very much to make everyone feel very, very important and um, really appreciated because we did 
deeply appreciate them coming and we gave some little lightning talks in the evening after dinner uh, just to sort of share some of our cool projects and interesting things that we were that we were doing um, and then the next day we opened 38 new issues in the Manchester one it was about the same in the London event and added a bunch of information one of the coolest things was that we had an artist who came along to both of these events and so we now have lots of openly CC BY available artwork that folks can use on, for example, the FAIR principles. Uh, these are some of the lessons that we learnt, and here was some just collections within our report of some of the reasons why people really enjoyed those two day long events. And there's a pull request open right now. It's, it's got a couple of approvals, so I think it will be merged quite soon, where I'm proposing um, an online collaboration cafe. So instead of having folks who, can, who have to spend 24 hours or a bit more of their time to come, physically come to um, a day-long event, this is uh, two hours every two weeks in a Zoom call, in a, in a sort of online, like a Skype call, where folks can... Um, work together they can either shut up and write which is what i did when i was writing up my thesis during uh, when i was in berkeley or they can go into um smaller breakout rooms and be able to collaborate together even if they're not um they're not physically located in the same space uh, we want to try and bring the collaboration online in real time and one of the rooms that we'll be working on is to help everybody be mentored through their first pull request. So fixing a typo, fixing a broken link, these are two of the most sort of useful contributions that we can have because they help folks get through that, um, that journey. It's going to start, it's going to be a soft start because I've because it's not even merged into the uh, main spec yet, but it's going to start next Wednesday. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to do these like three different Pomodoro sessions and then have a little space to chat and support each other. I think it's super important to explain how decisions are made. The bid specification is currently going through um, a big reorganization of its governance and so a lot of these what's happening next to my screenshots for talking through all of the different aspects of thinking through how decisions are made within the bids community there's lots of different groups there's lots of ways of um, addressing those we have a working document where everyone can uh, comment and leave suggestions and my point with this slide at the end here is that every project has a culture even if you haven't thought about it. And so this essay by Joe Freeman from the 1970s, it's a feminist essay that talks about the tyranny of structurelessness. Even if you don't have a governance um, document, even if you haven't written everything down, you do still have decisions being made at all times. It's just that they're likely to have been made from a clique of people who were, where it's, it's non-transparent how those decisions are being made. I'm coming to the end. I know I'm going a little bit over time. Um, I went to the last session at Mozilla's annual festival um, in October. Mozilla's annual festival, MozFest, is a really, really overwhelming space. It's a very, very participatory three days. Dirk Slater is currently pictured in here. He does the training for the facilitators, uh, but he led a session and I just was going to rock up because it was the end of the three days and I thought it'd be kind of fun to support my friend. And actually, it was really, really emotionally draining because what we were talking about was the life cycle of a project. And so in the design that his group has been working on, there is a preconception stage, there is a conception stage, there is birth, there is infancy, there is the youth, and then it becomes a mature project. And then there is the death of the project. And I think a lot of us think about getting started and there's quite a lot of people thinking about sustainability right now, but I don't hear very many people thinking about the graceful death, the end of a lovely project that did a great job, but is not a high priority for the team members anymore. What does it mean? How do you archive that? How do you make it so that it can still be accessed, even though folks don't need to, aren't currently working and developing on it? And maybe, you don't know, someone else will come along and there'll be a rebirth afterwards. I'm going to finish by saying that the most important rule, actually the most important rule, is just to show great, great appreciation for everyone who's coming along, whether they're paid or whether they're not paid. And I think that the Mozilla Open Leadership Programme does this. These are um, printouts of postcards that are handwritten and sent, 
uh, to all of the participants and all of the mentors. They are coordinated by Abby, who's based in Toronto, as you can see, and she sends out stickers and um, those handwritten notes. And I just have these, these four little screenshots of um, members of the community being really excited to receive those in the mail. And this is a picture of uh, my wall at, um, at work at the Turing Institute in London and a, and a note that I got and a little uh, pin that I was given and it means so much and most of the time I um, receive messages of not having done things, things are late, things haven't worked, they're not as good as they should be, why haven't you? And to be able to look up and be able to see some positive notes and encouragement, it's really good and that matters both online and offline. So those are my 10 rules. I'm way over time, so I'll stop. These are the links. The slides are all up online. The DOI is down at the bottom of those slides. You can't see them because of the coloring, but obviously if you download them, you'll have access to all of those different 10 projects that I showed you. I want to thank uh, all of the members of my lab and just acknowledge that I used a lot of photos from Unsplash and the Noun Project in making this talk. Thanks so much.